This video was voted for by patrons of Questions for Science. Unless you're living under a rock, you must have heard about the recent breakthrough in cold fusion technology. I'm talking about probably one of the greatest achievements in human history. This breakthrough will solve all our energy problems and be able to provide power to every person in the world. If you're curious about this breakthrough that you haven't heard of, I'm talking about this 1989 paper claiming to witness induced nuclear fusion of deuterium. Sure, it's been 30 years and there is still no replicable evidence, but I'm sure they're just working out the kinks. We should have legitimate cold fusion any day now. Any day now. Any day now. Any... Duh. Any day now. Oh, and, um, brains. Before debunking cold fusion, we first have to understand what nuclear fusion is. Fusion is when two nuclei, under the right conditions, fuse together, causing an immense release of energy. If you can create fusion, you can use the heat from the reaction to convert water into steam to then turn a generator, which sends electricity to homes. And voila, power. This all sounds well and good, but it's not going to happen, at least not for a while, because the temperature to permit the conditions for fusion are insanely high. Mmm, no, much hotter than this. The high heat causes two necessary changes to the atomic nuclei for fusion to occur. Firstly, the high temperature energizes the electrons so much that they're stripped off the orbitals around the nuclei. This changes the atoms into a naked nuclei and causes them to freely bounce around in a hot plasma of other nuclei. Normally, when these positively charged nuclei come in within close distance of each other, naturally they would repel. But this is nuclear fusion, so where's the fusion? The temperature has to be so high that the kinetic energy of the nuclei is stronger than the electrostatic forces repelling the two nuclei. Once these two conditions are met, we can achieve nuclear fusion. But just how hot do the conditions have to be for this to happen? Uh, just a little north of 100 million degrees Celsius? At the moment, the only place capable of maintaining this temperature is the sun's core. Now this brings us to the 100 million dollar question. Uh, pun intended. If you need 100 million degrees Celsius to achieve nuclear fusion, how is cold fusion, that is, <clears throat> fusion at room temperature, possible? Well, here's the thing, it's not. Well, it kind of is, but technically, mmm, no. But, yes. Alright, there is actually two types of cold fusion. The first is called muon catalyzed fusion and involves using muons instead of electrons, and occurs at room temperature, hence it being cold. Muons are similar to electrons in that they're both subatomic particles and are negatively charged, but muons are much heavier and therefore orbit closer to the nuclei allowing the nuclei to get within closer proximity to each other without repelling. This close proximity allows fusion to occur under the right conditions. The only downside is muons have very short lifespans of 2 microseconds, and the energy it takes to produce them is more than the energy generated by the fusion reaction. So at the moment, muon catalyzed fusion is kind of useless. The other cold fusion is the one that's more widely cited by the pseudoscience crowd, and is known as deuterium-induced fusion. In the late 1980s, two scientists by the name of Stanley Pons and Martin Fleischmann, who worked at the University of Utah, believed they had discovered room temperature fusion by fusing deuterium atoms together to make helium-4 isotope. Here's the explanation of their cold fusion experiment. In the protocol, Pons and Fleischmann set up a solution in lithium salt and heavy water, which is just a water molecule with deuterium atoms instead of hydrogen. Next, a palladium and platinum rod were immersed in the solution and attached to a battery. When a voltage was applied, the deuterium atoms separated from the oxygen in the heavy water molecule into positively charged deuterium ions. These positive deuterium ions navigated to the negatively charged palladium strip. Upon reaching the palladium, the ions gain an electron and are either converted into diatomic deuterium or a single deuterium atom. The diatomic deuterium floats out of the solution as a gas while the deuterium atoms, being so small, are able to migrate into the palladium lattice. Why atomic deuterium is migrating into a palladium structure is beyond me, and it makes no sense, but then again so does cold fusion. So. Whatever. As the voltage is further increased, more deuterium atoms migrate deeper into the palladium lattice. Eventually, so many deuterium atoms enter that it begins to expand and contract. This expansion and contraction causes the deuterium atoms to move back and forth in a uniform motion. Then by some unknown mechanism, the deuterium atoms decide to fuse together forming a helium-4 isotope, giving off excessive amount of heat, which in theory, if were to be scaled up, could power blah blah blah, you get the picture. Okay, I got some questions. 
Firstly, how did they manage to bring the atoms close to each other without using naked nuclei or muons? How were the deuterium atoms able to overcome the electrostatic forces that repel all atoms? Well, that didn't matter, because the University of Utah got wind of these results and set up a press conference ASAP in order to set a precedent to patent a new technology. Well, in the world of scientific research, jumping to a press conference after you've obtained your initial results without doing exhaustive replication first is sorta... Especially when that discovery is held in regard by the community as being highly impossible. This led to a whirlwind of negative press from the scientific community who started calling their discovery cold fusion as a backhanded remark. It got much worse when other researchers attempted to replicate the experiment, including Fleischmann and Pons. As Michael J. Schaefer puts it, a senior scientist at a major fusion research lab who is familiar with the story of cold fusion stated, There was an immediate rush to reproduce the Pons and Fleischmann experiments. A few experimenters reported success, many others failure. Even those who reported success had difficulty reproducing their results. Furthermore, no one was seeing the expected fusion products. That last line, no one was seeing the expected fusion products, was the final nail in the coffin for cold fusion. In theory, fusion of deuterium nuclei would yield a helium-4 isotope and gamma radiation. Though helium-4 was measured in extremely small quantities, its presence was attributed to the scarce helium found in the atmosphere. But more importantly, the real necessary fusion product that needed to be present was gamma radiation. If it could be measured, then the argument illustrated by the School of Athens painting would be that the helium present wasn't from the atmosphere, i.e. Plato's hand, but instead came from legit fusion, according to Aristotle. Unfortunately, no gamma radiation was ever detected, indicating fusion never took place. Pons and Fleischmann continued to attempt to reproduce their results, but ultimately failed. In 1992, Toyota, seeing a potential in cold fusion technology, hired both scientists to continue their research in their Imre lab in southern France. Life was good for Pons and Fleischmann. A state-of-the-art lab in southern France with millions of dollars worth of funding? Now they could prove the cold fusion haters wrong. Surely this would show that room temperature fusion was possible. Three years later, Fleischmann broke off and began his own research in England. In 1998, Toyota terminated their contract with Pons after spending nearly $40 million on cold fusion research and arriving with no tangible evidence. That same year, the company stopped all investigative research into cold fusion technology. Now, cold fusion, a distant bad memory for the science community, occasionally lurks on conspiracy forums and pseudoscience groups on the internet. Some believe cold fusion was sabotaged by oil corporations or the U.S. government. Some have claimed there are scientists who've achieved it, but aren't getting funding or fair coverage to further their research. Alas, we may never know. Wait, no. Cold fusion is bullsh**. On the stupid scale, I'm rating cold fusion at a 5 out of 10, because understanding nuclear fusion doesn't come easy to most people. For the harmful scale, it's at a 1 out of 10, because cold fusion doesn't really harm anyone. Except, maybe investors' pocketbooks, so, uh, 2 out of 10. And, uh, click the bell to subscribe, you know.